how your vital kernel thread crashes and the whole system goes down and your payload, you know, everything will be for nothing because you could have crashed the system to begin with anyway. Um, so recovery is, is vital for these kinds of exploits. And you have the stage phase, which ideally would be only a, a user, user space payload. So since we're running out of time, um, I think only a few words uh, on, on the stager phase, because that's, um, that's one of the most important phases. Um, there are two questions that you need to ask yourselves, yourselves uh, namely, where can I uh, copy my ring 0 or ring 3 payload? Um, I need a ring, or if I have a ring 0 payload, then I basically need a, a two-stage stager, or I need two levels of a stager. Um, and the second question is, uh, how can I install a hook um, that later on will execute my payload in a context that's desirable for me. Uh, so to really make it short, uh, we copied our uh, payload to the interrupt descriptor table because there are many uh, empty uh, uh, entries there. Uh, and we installed a system call hook. We, we hooked the, um, the sys uh, exec ve function. Um, okay, so to come to a very brief con conclusion. Um, fuzz 800 to 11 fuzzing is very cumbersome for the reasons that Clements uh, told you. Um, by moving the target into the virtual environment, uh, a lot of things get easier. The, the downside is that you have to uh, implement the, the virtual device. But we believe that you know, for manufacturers, for example, who have all the all the specifications of their hardware, this would be easy. Um, and then, as I hope to have shown you, that kernel vulnerabilities are not too different from user space uh, vulnerabilities. But to exploit them is more complex, simply because you have to be, because of the complexity of the kernel itself, and it's easier to mess up in there. Um, and it. You know, it might be able, or it, it is possible to write generic exploits, but you still have a number of parameters that are really important. For example, the, the address of the Jump ESP, uh, it gets more complicated with uh, the recovery. And in all the cases, you, you, know, you need to know really in, in what kind of uh, situation does my uh, exploit occur. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, re really every vulnerability is a story of its own. Um, here we have put in a few references, uh, QAMO that we used in, in the demo, and a uh, paper in the most recent um, FRAC edition, which gives you a good overview over kernel exploits. And if you check the references, it also has many interesting references. Uh, and finally, we'd like to take this uh, opportunity to thank our teachers, Chris and Engin. Engin is right here at the back, uh, who are really cool teachers. And our advisor at SEC Consult, Bernhard, who uh, owns the, the web hacking server out there and is also really good at uh, the Wii bowling, I'm told. Uh, so he really helps us a lot, too. Uh, yeah, and so now we have, hopefully, a few minutes before lunch to answer a few questions, if you have any. So, the, um, but that's also, you know, we're just dealing with the, the software driver anyway. So. Uh, many drivers have firmware, for example, 
the, the terrorist driver, the McWhitey driver, uh, has parts of the firmware not in, as a firmware image, like most drivers have, but uh, in the, as a, as a uh, closed source. Uh, yeah, but not, not much longer, though. <laughs> no, they, they um, just gave, made the announcement in September, end of September, that, the, that they're changing over to the Open Hell version. Uh, there were some allegations that the, the open hell version used illegal parts you know from Atheros, but but basically they had uh, investigations and it came to nothing so now they decided you know to go all open source but still that doesn't really uh, that's not really a problem for us because even if there's a problem inside it's fine the only version we already yeah, find that it yeah exactly it, it crashes and we know and we can do some reverse engineering but on the means if you have to know exactly what the driver does well, we're, we're fuzzing Windows drivers and we have no idea if the source code there, so we're fuzzing everything. Yes, so but this means you, you have to, to, to have some knowledge of the, of the hardware. Well, you, you need to do reverse engineering basically, but that's the, that's the why we believe it would be more easy for, or easier for the vendors themselves. Yeah, that's yeah. actually, uh, you know what I started doing when I walk around in this room, I see, oh, there's a, a laptop from somewhere, and I, oh, I know that's in the terrorist part right here. Just because I've started looking at laptops and, and I see, okay, well, I see some somebody there with an HP laptop, it's Linux, oh, I gotta start my tools. I hope it's a patched version. <laughs> really, if any laptops crash in the afternoon, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We did, um, I mean, we, you know, the, the vi virtual fuzzing, of course, we tested it, you know, in, in real life. And it's so easy to start programming. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the funny part about it. So you verified uh, with real hardware before uh, exactly. uh, giving yeah. a bug to it. Yeah. So we didn't yes. find any uh, false positives that crashed on the virtual machine, but not in real life. But we tr tried everything, uh, whatever we found. I mean, if we, you know, find a, uh, or if the, the system crashes, it might be because something in the virtual device is wrong, of course, so you need to verify with the real hardware. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Or it's, uh, you said that you didn't find any false bugs. Yeah. Did you find any false negatives? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> When we do uh, faithful fuzzing, there's always a problem with timing, things like that. But we didn't find anything like that. And to be honest, um, we have what we really try to present here is not fuzzer itself, but the framework that is really beneath the fuzzer. And the fuzzer that I wrote uh, was about three hours of programming, really hacking together some parts of Wireshark and my my framework or our framework. It was writing exploits you or yeah, it's exploits or fuzzle, whatever, using the framework is really straightforward. So the really big part about it is the framework itself. So the I ask because um, if you do uh, simulation and visualization, and I've noticed like if you're, if you're debugging in an exploit, yeah. uh, just by actually, you could have, you could do it like step by step, um, it ends up happening completely different from when it happens in real life, so you actually go backward policy in a debugger class. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah, no, but I think the best thing right there would be just to find a uh, find vulnerability and then switch to real hardware and go on exploiting it right there. But also because you're not trying to find the exploit in the first step anyway, but just the vulnerability. I mean, if you find something and you know you investigate and then you find out that you can't reproduce it, um, you know it's still. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.